How are you guys? Good to see ya. Have a seat. Have I told you lately that I love you? Yes. I've got a couple of classy guests today. Figured I better wear a coat. <laughs> Don't want them to be slumming up here on stage. We're glad you're here. I want to welcome all 20 of our campuses and those of you watching online. If you'll take out your message notes right now inside your program. For the last four weeks, uh, we have been looking at loving like Jesus in a fractured world. And each week we've looked at a different group of people who are in pain that God calls us to love. And the first week we looked at loving people who are hurt by racism, prejudice, and bigotry. Dr. John Perkins helped me with that message. The next week we looked at people who are hurt by being marginalized, people we overlook that you don't see. And I told you that Jesus doesn't go after the marginalized, he changes the margins, he moves them. Last week we looked at people who were hurt by broken relationships and I had Ed Stetzer come and help us with that on being ministry, ministers of reconciliation in a broken world. This week we're gonna look at sexual abuse and assault and harassment. Now, the Bible commands us to care about people who are abused. And in scripture, there are probably maybe two dozen different kinds of abuse talked about. But specifically today, we're gonna talk about sexual abuse. And the Bible says this, if you look on your outline, Hebrews chapter 13, verse three. I love this in the message paraphrase. Look on victims of abuse as if what happened to them had happened to you. That's how much we're supposed to identify with people in pain. Now right up front, I wanna say two or three things. Uh, first, this is an incredibly complex issue. It is multi-layered. It is not simple, there's no six easy steps. And there's no way that we could possibly cover all the layers, all the levels, and all the complexity of sexual abuse, assault, and harassment. But we're gonna make an attempt to deal with some of it uh, today. Second, this is gonna be a, a session of hope. And we're gonna look at the solutions. And it'll be a hope-filled session. We're not gonna just deal with all of the problem. I mean, when John Perkins was here, I could give him six weeks to tell horror stories of racism. But instead, we went straight to the point, so what's the solution? What are we gonna do about it? And that's what we're gonna do today uh, to give help and hope and, and healing. The third thing I wanna say is as your pastor, in a crowd this big, I know many of you have been abused. And I'm sorry, that, that hurts me, that grieves me. And I just wanna say, we hear you, we see you, we acknowledge your pain, it matters. It matters to God, God cares about your pain. As your pastor, I care about your pain. I, it grieves me, I could tear up over it. It also makes me angry at the perpetrators and, and I can get angry about that. But that's why we're gonna deal with this today because we don't shy away from anything in this church. We courageously say, what does God say about it, and what is the truth, and what is the path to hope and healing? Now, I, I need to begin by just acknowledge the prevalence of the problem. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, so let me just ask. Everybody agree this is a problem? Yeah, right? Okay, it's a big deal. Just pick up a newspaper. And every day there is a scandal uh, of sexual abuse, assault, or uh, harassment. And I'm not gonna belabor this point because I really do wanna get the solution, but let me just give you a couple statistics. Every 98 seconds, somebody in the United States is sexually assaulted. This is not an unusual problem. Every 98 seconds. It may be a woman, it may be a girl, it may be a man, it may be a boy. But every 98 seconds. In the past 20 years, 17,700,000 women have been raped. That is unconscionable. One out of every four women have experienced sexual violence. One out of every four. 
and this is gonna surprise you, one out of every six men has experienced sexual violence. One out of every six men. If we were to make a memorial to the children in the United States who have been sexually abused, it would need to be 1,300 times larger than the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which has 50,000 names on it. Now, we really shouldn't be surprised at this because the Bible tells us over and over again that as history moves on, as we get closer to the end of the age, as we get closer to the end times, things get worse, not better. 2,000 years ago, Paul told Timothy, he gave him a list of 19 sins. He said, these are gonna get worse as time goes on in history. And four of those 19 sins specifically deal with uh, sexual abuse. I, I'm, I didn't write them all down, but in 2 Timothy chapter three, there on your outline, Paul says this. Understand this, there will be very difficult times in the last days. People will be self-absorbed, they will be money hungry, self-promoting, arrogant. Does this vaguely sound like today? Do you recognize any of those in today's culture? Yeah. And then he says, these specific four, they will be abusive, they will be abusers, lacking in self-control, brutal, and addicted to lust. Now we need to start with a, a definition. What is sexual abuse? Well, I wrote down a pretty simple definition right there in your outline, that sexual abuse is any visual, verbal, or physical sexual activity without consent. Let me say, okay, I understand the verbal, I understand the physical, what's the visual? It's when you're exposed, either in person or by photo photograph or by film. Maybe somebody sends you an unwanted message in the mail of a lewd picture or something. That would be the visual part. Now, this is so complex. Uh, I've asked for some help today. And I've got two beloved Bible teachers. They are both um, best-selling authors. One of them is a dear friend, the other one I'm married to. <laughs> Would you stand and give a warm welcome to Beth Moore and Kay Warren. Yeah, woo! -hoo! All right. All right, let's get started. Now, first, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Kay. So for helping happy. me with this. And uh, thank you for not running away after last night's services. <laughs> <laughs> you came back. Um, I want us to begin with uh, talking about the damage that it causes and, 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 and the devastation. Many people are not aware that something that can happen very quickly can actually affect you the rest of your life. And can, uh, it, I don't know anybody who gets over this quickly. Not anybody. Uh, it's, it has a, a, a dimension to it that uh, lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. So I wanna begin by just having you guys tell your stories. Beth, why don't you? You know, for me, it's such a full circle moment to be with all of you and to be able to so directly address these issues because church was my safe place growing up. I know that it hasn't been for everyone, but it was for me. I was raised in the church every single time the doors open, of the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and, and sometimes several times during the rest of the week. Mm. It was my home that was unsafe. Mm. It was my home where I suffered the abuse and the total sexual dysfunction of a household. Mm. So it was that place that was fearful for me to go into. And things happening so early and becoming aware of things so early before you even have a definition for them, before you even know what someone is doing, all you know is that in your young little heart, you know what they're doing is wrong, but you are too powerless and to overcome and too small to say it. And so this is what I grew up with. And it happened so early in my fundamental um, 
uh, growing years that the things that should have developed in my life, like healthy boundaries, knowing how to say no to someone that, that I, this is the circle around me. I get to say who comes in this circle and who does not. A healthy, uh, secure relationships, just security, the anxiety and fear daily, mm. especially if it's in your home because there's no escaping it. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean that it happened every single day, but the fear of it and the knowledge of it, you who are supposed to protect me are my perpetrator. I cannot begin to tell you. I've said so many times to whoever would listen, what may take an abuser five minutes oh. is costing that woman or man. There are little boys that are also abused, little girls, adults. So it costs them for the rest of their lives if they don't know how to come to that kind of healing in Jesus. Mm. Katie? Well, and Beth and I, you know, have had several opportunities to share this now, and I think that we would say we both feel incredibly honored to be able to represent all the people who have been abused. Most um, girls and women, men and boy, will not have the opportunity to be on a stage and tell their story and receive an ovation of people saying, we appreciate we, what you've gone through. Most people will not have that opportunity, and so Beth and I don't take that lightly, that we get to be a voice for so many who don't have a voice. Um, from the little girls that I um, met in Cambodia who were trafficked and were kept behind iron gates, and I watched Western men lining this little tiny street in this little tiny town waiting for dusk so that when dusk came, they had the opportunity to go in and to sexually abuse little girls. So from those little girls to um, the stories I've heard through the years here at Saddleback to my own story. My own story, I was raised in a, um, a pastor's home and it was actually at church where abuse occurred for me. Uh, the son of our church janitor molested me when I was about five or six years old. And I didn't tell anybody. I didn't go home and tell my parents. Um, I don't know if it's because I didn't really have have language for it other than as Beth said I knew it was wrong I knew that this wasn't supposed to be happening but I didn't know what to say I also think the climate of my home was very repressed shall we say uh -huh. um, um, my sex education, uh, you know how we, we say we're gonna teach kids the birds and the bees? Well, mine literally was with the little golden book of knowledge with pictures of birds and bees. <laughs> um, my mother turned the word sex into about a 14 syllable word. It was like sex. So I don't know if it, I love my mother dearly, but but that was the way it was. And um, so I don't know if it's because I didn't have language or because I knew the climate in my home was not conducive to talk about anything as awful as sexual abuse. All I know is, is I buried that deeply in the recesses of my mind. And I didn't think about it again until I was 19 in a college class. And something in that psychology class that day, it was, it, it's like that memory just hit a little bit and went, boom, and landed right, and I knew it, and I sat there in shock, reliving what had happened to me so long ago. But when I had that um, awakening again of what had happened to me, it explained myself to me. Because after the molestation experience, I was very confused about sex and sexuality. I was very curious, but I was also repelled. I was fascinated and, and um, very upset about it at the same time. Um, it caused a lot of sexual experimentation when I was a young girl. As I said, my dad was a pastor, and he had marriage books on the shelves in our living room, and I would, um, when nobody was looking, go and pull those books off the shelf because it talked about sex. And so I wanted to read what it said about sex, but I was also very upset and disgusted at the same time. So when I was 19 and re remembered, it put a lot of um, information to myself of, oh, that's why this has been so confusing, so difficult, so, so upsetting and such, creating such strong emotions that I didn't even have any idea why they were there. So our stories are a little different, but, but, um, but still very powerful how they've affected us. Well, and us. the reactions can often be, even though people have different stories, the reactions are often very similar because they're classic things. In the Bible, uh, it talks a lot about abuse, different kinds of abuse. In Psalm 39, we have David's reaction to abuse. I want you to notice on your outline, Psalm 39, 
verses one and two. Here's what David did after he was abused. And this is classic uh, response. Psalm 39, one to four. David said, I will not say anything while evil people are near. So I kept quiet, not saying a word. He's afraid to talk about it. But my suffering only grew worse and I was overcome with anxiety. And the more I thought, the more troubled I became. I could not keep from asking, Lord, how long will I live? When will I die? Tell me how soon my life will end. Now friends, this is a classic response to abuse. First, he's afraid to talk about it. And typically we don't, we don't talk about it. And particularly he's afraid to talk about it in the presence of the perpetrators. Second, his silence made it worse, made it worse. Third, he starts internalizing this and it turns into anxiety and fear. He said, I got anxious, I get panicky. And then he begins to be obsessed with death. How long will I live, when will I die? Tell me how soon my life will end. Abuse can be so painful that it can lead you to thoughts of suicide as the only way out. If you have felt this way, your church wants to help. We, we want to help. We are, we are here to give hope and help. But you have to tell us. You have to open up and say, I have been hurt. And when you open that door, it just relieves all the pressure. And you start, it's not the end of the journey, but it's the start of the journey. And there will be people who will walk uh, through it with you. We, we want to help. Okay, talk a little bit about some specific damaging effects that we see. Yeah, well, we are whole, we are whole beings. We are body, soul, spirit, mind. We are, we're not just a body or just a mind or just emotions. And so, and damage happens in every level of, of our being. And when it comes to our bodies, I, I mean, obviously the abuse happens first in the body. And the one of the very primary things that happens is the loss of control over your own body, your own self is no longer within your control. Someone else um, uses you or takes advantage of you or manipulates you or, or um, does terrible things to your body. And um, that can of course cause sense of sometimes um, people will disassociate from their body. It's like, okay, so I can't stop what's happening here physically to my body, but with my mind, I'm over here in this other place, I'm playing soccer, I'm you know watching a TV show in my mind while my body is being abused because the painfulness of, of absorbing what's happening to the body and the mind is often too much to bear. I think that also what we see happens is people tend to hate their body because it was their body that that attracted the attention of, of the abuser. And so then it can lead to a sense of hating this physical body because the abuser might say things like, oh, you're so cute or you're so pretty or, you know, you're just, this is, this is what, this is what daddies, this is the way daddies express their love. This is the way mommies express their love to, and, and so there becomes this sense of, I hate my body because it's what's inviting this abuse. Um, then there's emotions. I mean, the emotional damage. Not only do we disassociate from our body and stop feeling in our body because of the abuse, but also we stop feeling emotionally after a while because the, it creates emotions of fear and anger and guilt and shame. But one of the reactions to that sometimes is just to try to stop feeling at all mm -hmm. because it's just so painful. But um, when it comes to this sense of um, Powerlessness, one of the emotions that some people kind of hang on to is anger because it's the only thing you can do. If somebody's hurting you in the body, at least you've got this emotional sense of power with anger. And then our thinking is, is affected because um, abuse shapes our worldview. As Beth said, um, she was so small when it happened that it shaped her worldview and it, it affected how she thought about, uh, I'll let her tell that in a minute, but, but also if the abuse happened a little bit later, your worldview may actually be shattered by abuse and everything that you thought, everything that you believed, everything that you were used to or were expecting just got turned topsy-turvy. So it can either create a worldview or it can actually shatter a worldview. Beth, so talk about that, uh, how it affected your thinking. Well, I, I'd love to do it. You guys, I am just about to burst to tell you something <laughs> that I have just now put together in the timeline of my own recovery in Christ. Oh. 
I've not thought about this before. When you were saying this about Psalm 39 uh -huh. and how the psalmist, he couldn't speak, felt like he couldn't tell anyone, he restrained his lips yeah. and he felt like he just wanted to die. I was thinking back on the course of my life and when the point was that I really would pray. I had a heart to love Jesus from the time I was a little bitty girl. And when, but when I was a young adolescent, I remember telling him over and over again, when I would go to sleep at night, if you love me, I will not wake up in the morning. Mm. If you love me, mm. I will not wake up in the morning. If you love me, don't let me wake up in the morning. Mm. And it's the only period of my life where I would tell you that I had sustained suicidal thoughts. Mm. But listen, Rick, mm. I, am, I thought, what sort of ended that? Because I've had so many difficult times since then. Mm. I mean, terrible times. What ended that? I am willing to think it was around that time without saying too much that someone under my own roof, I had a large family, someone under my own roof conveyed something to me that caused us both to look at each other and realized we had both suffered the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, see, the power of me too mm -hmm. is we too. Mm -hmm. There was something about Rick, uh -huh. I think there was something about finally yeah. being able to go, what? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. That, I believe, was my first step out, oh. was that all of a sudden, if you have been abused, raped, assaulted, some of you in this room or some of you watching, you have never told anyone. Oh, yeah. We heard, Kay heard from some people last night that just said, I'm telling for the first time. I've had women hug, hug me and whisper in my ear, this is the first time I've ever told anyone. There is such power in this. For me, that thinking, and I'll say this one last thing, it was true. To be able, I, I thought and processed all of life as a victim. This followed me into my young adulthood. And so the process of trying to rethink all over again, like a victor, that that was for me, that was key. Absolutely, so you learn to believe lies and not the truth, and then relationally, I'll just say this, the last thing about this is that abuse affects relationships, because abuse happens in relationships, meaning it's you know two or more people who are involved in the abuse, so that is a relational kind of wound that happens, and so that wound carries over into many, if not most, relationships, because you don't know how to trust. Trust has been broken. Trust has been shattered. As Beth said, the, the people she was supposed to, particularly a, a person that she was supposed to be able to turn to, she was not able to, and that affects then, we don't know who we can trust. We lose our voice. We lose our ability to speak up for ourselves, to set boundaries, to be able to say, no, this, this is my body and you can't do that to me. Um, the ability to have our own dreams and ability in setting limits and boundaries. So the relational wounds are huge as well. You know, what Beth just said, how many times have you heard me say this? Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. That's so good. How many times? <laughs> many, many times. Write it down, honey, write it down. <laughs> Revealing your feeling is the beginning. It's got a lot of those. I'm gonna okay. give Beth permission to tweet that today. <laughs> it's the and, and, and when you do, you don't have to tell everybody, but you have to tell somebody. Yes. And when you do, the doors open and all of a sudden that boogeyman in the closet shrinks in size. Now, what they've both pointed out is that the effects of sexual abuse are severe, which by the way, is why God judges it severely. Why God punishes it severely, even more than some other sins, because of the severity of its effect. On your outline, the Bible says in Luke chapter 17, this is Jesus talking, verses one and two. Situations that cause people to sin are bound to happen. Now, what, why is that? Because we're all sinners, because we all make mistakes. We, nobody's perfect. Uh, we, we, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so sin is gonna happen. We, we're not surprised by that, that people will sin against you. But it says, but the punishment will be terrible for anyone who causes others to lose their faith. And it would be better for a person to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck than to harm one of these little children. 
Friends, there is no hope without a savior. That's serious punishment. It's why I need a savior, you need a savior, we, we all do. Now, I want us to move on and talk about uh, the process of healing. Uh, there are many, many examples of abuse in the Bible of different kinds. When Jeremiah was uh, abused, he says this in Lamentations chapter three, there on your outline. You saw them abuse me, Lord, so make things right. And that's natural, we want things to be made right. We wanna be right again a after, after an abuse. And when David was abused, he cries for relief, not just justice, but relief. And in Psalm 118, five, he says, in my anguish, and if you've been abused, you know what the word anguish means. It's just that churning, churning inside of you. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me, by get, setting me free. So we all need to be set free. We all need to have things set right in our lives. Let's talk about this, some specific steps I'd like for you guys to talk about, about how do you begin the journey toward healing. It doesn't happen overnight, but what are some early steps? Yeah, well, um, there's a, a good book that I recommend to you. It's called Mending the Soul. And um, on our website, uh, Saddleback website, there's gonna be some resources you'll hear about. And this, there's a chart from this book that's gonna cover the material that I'm gonna tell you. So you can write it down quickly, but then you can go to the website and get the chart for a fuller explanation of it. But um, six things quickly that I would say help us get started in this process of healing. And the very first one is to establish safety. You cannot begin to recover, begin to um, heal from sexual abuse without some sort of safety, if it, if it may be one person, a trusted friend, a, a, um, a somebody, a, a Bible study leader, it could be a counselor, but somebody has to provide some safety for you to be able to even begin this process. Um, for me, um, I, I know one of the reasons that I didn't talk about it for so long after I remembered it was because I felt incredibly unsafe, and I felt as though that if I were to talk about it, that, that the depth of emotions and pain were so strong that I would literally go crazy that if I tried to process it and tried to process how I felt, that I would lose my mind. I would break. I would not be able to recover from where my mind would take me. And um, so when I was 40, um, I remember the day that Rick and I sat in our bedroom and he, with tears rolling down his face, said, we need to get help for the ways that sexual abuse has affected you and affected our marriage. Now we had talked about it or tried to talk about it for many years by that point. We'd been married for probably 16, 18 years at that point. And, um, and every time we would start to talk about it, I would say, no, I can't talk, I, I can't talk about it. I can't go there, I can't go there. Mm. And when we were 40, Rick just finally said, we have to get some help and whether you go or not, I'm going to go. And of course, I was so mad at him, <laughs> no. You may not, <laughs> you may not go and tell my story. And he's like, it's our story. Mm -hmm. This affects both of us and I'm going to go. And so I was mad at him. I was mad at the counselor before I even got there. I was terrified. Um, I remember walking into the counselor's office, walking in, sitting down, getting up, running out, mm -hmm. calming myself down, walking back in, sitting down, getting up, running out. <laughs> And it was really about the third time of just me being overwhelmed with these sense of emotions that I made myself stay in the chair long enough to be able to begin to believe that this was a place of safety that I could finally start healing from abuse. So you and I have to start with that place of safety. The second is to choose to face the truth and feel. I made a decision once I was in that safe place that said, I'm going to do, now I don't know what it's gonna take to heal, but I'm gonna make that decision, which means I'm going to allow myself to start to feel some of these feelings. That didn't fix it. That didn't put a bow on the package. I wasn't done when I walked out of there that day, but I did make a decision. And so you and I have to make a decision to choose the truth no matter how hard it is, and start to feel. And then to start telling your story. Stories matter. Yeah. Our stories matter. Stories are, are the pictures and the pieces of our lives. And to begin to connect what happened to us and tell that story to trusted, safe people. As Beth, I mean, she just exemplified that in this moment to say when she's told someone else or just made that contact with somebody else, suddenly there was the ability, okay, I, I, I don't know how I'm gonna heal all this, but it's gonna happen. And so when we tell our stories, it starts 
connecting us to the feelings that we have had, that we've pushed down, that we've ignored, that we've tried to pretend weren't there to connect us to the shame. And then to, to identify the distortions and reclaim God's original design would be the next step. Start seeing the lies, the distortions that you've believed your whole life about God, about yourself, about relationships, about men, about women, about what it means to be um, in, in intimacy. Because this kind of abuse affects intimacy, not just sexual intimacy, but relational, the ability to tell who you are to somebody else. And then five is to repent of deadness and denial. Because like I said, one of the wounds is that, it, that we go dead. We go dead inside, we go numb, we, we're frozen and we can't really articulate um, who we are and how to say it. And, and to repent of that, to understand that we were made richly by God to feel, to experience emotions and the, the, the abuse has caused us to stop Wanting, I don't. I remember being in um, Mother uh, Teresa's, one of the home for abused children in in Rwanda, and here was a whole huge room of babies, up to a year old, lying in a crib. And I expected to walk into a room full of babies and hear noise, screaming, crying, and it was silent. Mm -hmm. And the nuns explained to me that babies, if they aren't picked up when they cry, if they're not cuddled, if they're not nurtured, if they're not comforted, they learn very quickly that no one is going to come to them and so it doesn't do any good to cry. Mm. And if that's what happens to you with abuse, when you learn that your desires are not met, that what you've wanted doesn't happen, that that want for closeness isn't gonna be there. You go dead and you stop desiring. And so there's this step of being able to come back to God and say, God, this is what happened because of abuse, but I let that go. I begin to let that go. I repent of my deadness and ask that you fill me instead. And then mourning the loss and daring to hope because the Bible says those who mourn are the ones who will be comforted. And you and I have to let ourselves feel enough through this process so that we begin to mourn what was taken. Yes. Oh my goodness, the catalog of all that was taken, but all that you have lost through the years through the abuse and you mourn that. And as you mourn, then hope is born. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, this thing of process, Beth, I think you'd probably agree with this, is, 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 is a start stop. It's yes. a start stop. Yes. It's two steps forward, yes. three steps back. Just this week, getting ready for this message, I've been talking about the sexual abuse that happened to me for almost 30 years. This is not a new topic for me. I've been in process for a yeah. very long time. But this week, getting ready for this, a lot of old feelings came popping to the surface. And my thought was, <laughs> I thought I was done feeling that. <laughs> yes. No, no. I, did you have that this yes. week? I don't know if you did. You don't have to pretend you did or you didn't, but, <laughs> but, but I did. Yeah. And I, <laughs> make it sound good if you did. No, okay. I, you know, <laughs> I think for me, I, can, I cannot believe this is happening. Mm. So what, what sort of turned that for me, because yes, where you feel a little bit of that, yeah. okay, here we go. Okay. But it was offset by the fact that we are in a church and we are addressing sexual assault and abuse from the stinking platform. <laughs> from the platform. Okay. I don't know, I expect to hear more out of you than that. Okay, it's nine o'clock, it's early, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, and what I wanna say here as you're processing abuse and processing what, it is not your fault. Yeah. It is not your fault. It is not your fault. It never was and it never will be. And do not listen to the lie that if I had only done this differently, if I hadn't been there, if I hadn't said that, if, and then you start filling in all the things that are about you, if you had been or said or something different, it was not your fault. And as you begin to accept that, you can begin this process of healing from sexual abuse. Beth, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, I was thinking that Kay is so right. I agree with every bit of that, and I also believe firmly in godly counseling. Mm. But I, I wonder if I might also challenge you because of what she has described, that it is often three steps forward and two steps back, mm. that one of the things that you're going to find in the process is that Jesus himself, it is the healer that becomes 
so important to mm-hmm. you, not just the healing. Yeah. So try to think of it that way, that I'm not just trying to get to the finished result because we're That's really good. gonna have that when we see him face to face, Kay. Right. But what, right. what happened for me, Rick, is that I, I fell in love with Jesus. Mm-hmm. I truly did. Because I think, let, let me say briefly, when you've been through what we've been through, what many of you have been through, when you have been overpowered, you become suspicious of people in power. And so needless to say, how that can undermine your relationship with God is titanic because he's the big one and no one can stop him and whatever he's got a mind to do, he can do. Well, that's all allergic talk to people with abuse backgrounds like ours, Mm -hmm. except that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That you realize that your God has no dark side Mm. at all. That he is a defender of the powerless. And he is a redeemer of the broken and a healer of those who have been just completely fractured by harm that has come to them. So he, it was, it was Jesus himself, the fact that he, how he felt about it. In fact, I want to say to you, One of the reasons I began to pray for my abuser with compassion was because the verse troubled me so much about how Jesus felt about those that abused. Mm. I thought then have mercy on him, Mm. have mercy. I'm gonna be all right. Mm. Have mercy on him, Mm. God, have mercy on him. Mm. Well, that leads us to where I wanna go next. Since this series is called Loving Like Jesus, in a fractured world, I want us to talk a little bit about how Jesus cares for people in pain, specifically. Sympathy is when you say, I'm sorry you hurt. When you, when you see somebody hurting and you say, I'm sorry you hurt, you've just shown sympathy. Empathy is, I'm hurting with you. Big difference. I'm not just sorry you hurt, I'm, I'm hurting with you, that's empathy. Compassion is, I will do anything I can to stop your hurt. That's compassion. And repeatedly through the scripture, the Bible doesn't say Jesus showed sympathy or empathy. It says Jesus was moved with compassion. I will do whatever it takes to stop your hurt. Even if it means going to the cross and dying and shedding my blood for you, I will do whatever it takes to stop your hurt. Now the Bible is filled with many, many stories of the compassion of Jesus Christ for people in pain. And the Bible is filled with many, many stories of Jesus showing compassion specifically to women and how he raised their value and dignity in a world that treated them like chattel or dogs or whatever. And Jesus raised them to a whole different level. I could give you many examples of how Jesus dealt with women Um, in pain, but let me just show you one because it gives a classic model of how he deals with you. The way he dealt with this woman is the way he deals with you, and it's there on your outline. In Matthew chapter nine, we have the story of Jesus is walking through a crowd. Now, the crowds Jesus had were enormous. In fact, they were so big, they were called multitudes. Literally, thousands and thousands of people could follow Jesus around. And in this huge crowd, evidently, there was a woman in intense, secret pain. And she'd carried this pain for year after year after year. Jesus is walking through the crowd. She's actually behind him. He's not seeing her. And here's what the Bible says in verse 22. Jesus turned around, and he saw the woman, and he said, be encouraged, dear daughter, your faith has healed you. And at that very moment, the woman was restored to health. Now this is, again, classic what Jesus does. First, Jesus pays attention to your pain. Notice, he's not looking at her, he can't see that her face is grimaced, that he can't see the frown of the the fear or the pain on her face. He can't see her stooped shoulders. She's standing behind him, but he's in this crowd and he's so sensitive, he turns around because he knows somebody's pain. That's how sensitive Jesus is to your pain. He, He knows it in advance. 
and he turns around, he did not keep going. I told you a couple weeks ago, a lot of people like to study the steps of Jesus. I like to study the stops of Jesus. When did Jesus stop? Whenever he was going somewhere, he would often be interrupted and he'd turn around and do a miracle. Almost every miracle in Jesus' ministry was an interruption. It was not planned, it wasn't, I'm gonna go here and do this miracle. It happened while he was on the way. If you wanna be an agent of miracles, if you wanna be an agent of healing, if you wanna love like Jesus in a fractured world, you gotta be willing to be interrupted. You gotta be willing to stop and turn around when somebody's in pain behind you and you didn't even see them, but they're there. And when you do that, he pays attention. Then. Jesus focuses on your pain. It says he saw the woman. Now he's laser focused. He's looking at her. Everywhere Jesus went, he gave a look, a word, and a touch. A look, a word, and a touch. A look, a word, and a touch. And to be like Christ at school or work or anywhere else, you give people a look, a word, and a touch. He looks you in the eye. That says you valued, you're valuable to me. He gives them a word of encouragement and then a touch of affirmation. And then Jesus treats you tenderly. Notice he says, dear daughter. He doesn't say, hey you. He's not rude to this woman. He's not treating her as an interruption. He says, dear daughter. That's a familiar, familiar term, a family term. And it's, it's a term of endearment. And when you come to Jesus in your pain, he says to you, dear daughter, dear, dear son, dear daughter, you, you are beloved, you're in my family. And then Jesus rewards your trust. He says, your faith has made you whole. And when you come and say, God, I'm scared to death and I don't know what to do, but here's what I wanna do. I wanna move forward, I wanna be free, I wanna be healed, he rewards your faith. Now I've told you before that when we're talking about relationships, the way you move from fake community to real community is through the tunnel of truth. The way you move from fake intimacy to real intimacy is to go through the tunnel of truth, and that's involving conflict. When I talk to a married couple, they said, we never argue, then I say, well, you've got a shallow relationship. <laughs> because it's impossible for two sinners to marry each other and not have conflict. Yes. So it just means you're sweeping it under the carpet and you're not getting to the real deepest level of soul intimacy God intends for you to have with your spouse, your, your husband or your wife. And just as the only way you can get from fake community, phony community, phony fellowship to real fellowship is to go through that tunnel of truth, the same is true to move from brokenness to healing. And the way you get over here is you go through that tunnel of truth and you, you start to tell your story as Beth and Kay were talking about and you start to talk about it and you start to remember and you start to deal and you know what, that's scary. You've just talked about that. It's frightening, it's scaring you to death. In fact, um, uh, Beth, you were, I'll just stop here. You were talking about, about you were afraid you were losing your mind. Yes. Let's talk about that. Oh, absolutely. I think Kay and I would both say that as well as many of you who've testified to it that you're afraid if you go there, your mind's gonna break. That, there's some, that you're going to somehow hit an abyss and just fall into it and never come back. But the craziest part of it for me was that I did not lose my mind, I found it. Mm. That what, that what um, it did for me to really look into the brokenness is there, my chains truly were broken. And I'm not just using mm -hmm. a spiritual language there, I mean it, that that was the very thing I feared doing the most, which was dealing with it, was was what God used to set me free, absolutely. You know, in the Bible, there's two stories of going through major bodies of water. When God parts the Red Sea, and then the children of Israel go through it with Moses, but then when they get to the Promised Land, they've gotta go across the Jordan River, and it's flooded and swelling, and God says, you jump in first. Yes. And then I'll, I'll lower the water. And that's what happens in this situation. You jump in first, yes. and that's scary but God will, will lower the, the waters. Now, Jesus obviously cared about people. Um, Beth, what was so radical about the way Jesus treated women? I, I love this topic so much because, of course, in that day, the exclusion of women was just rife. I mean, it was the way 
of life. And so here comes Jesus, and he's making a point of it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You look at how many times he goes out, what, what we would call out of his way mm -hmm. to call out a woman or make sure she is on the page over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I, I love all the occasions where we see Mary of Bethany called into Bible study. She got to sit there mm -hmm. on the floor and listen to him teach. I'm thinking of all the times it, we see him relieving the suffering or uh, bringing back from the dead uh, someone, a child at 12. He, he raised Peter's mother-in-law from her sickbed. He brought back a young man from the dead whose mother was a widow and she would have no way whatsoever of caring for herself. Over and over, I see him tending to the suffering that had come to them by no fault of their own. Mm. But to be just most candid with you, what has been most helpful to me in the scriptures is to watch how Jesus was when it came to women who had done a whole lot of suffering that was their own fault. Mm. And I want to echo over and over what Kay said. Abuse is not our fault. Mm. It is not our shame. Mm. But instead of being able to get some help early on, you know, I grew up out of that into my adolescence and into my young womanhood and made every foolish decision you can possibly imagine cycling in and out of a stronghold of sin. I, I No boundaries just foolishness, just foolishness, and feel like you have just completely defiled yourself. Mm. And to watch Jesus, Luke 7, with the, the woman, the sinful woman who comes in and, and washes his feet with her tears, and he says to Simon the Pharisee, do you see this woman? Do you see mm. what she is doing for me? I think about John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. There, this, this is the most perfect picture because he's meeting with her at a time when she, he knows she's coming by herself so that no one... She won't have to face anyone mm -hmm. at that well. But when she leaves him after he has confronted her over all the men that she's been with, she runs back into town. Listen to these words. John 4, 39. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> going, yes, let's do. I mean, who, who would want to? But this is Jesus when he's the kind that, you, that he knows everything you did instead of you leaving his presence with shame, you leave with your dignity that he's the kind that can go, I know every bit of this. I know what's happened in the darkness. I know everything. And yet out of that conversation comes healing. I want to tell you one other thing. This scene with the adulterous woman in John 8, remember it? Where they drag this woman out who's caught in the midst of adultery, stand her before the crowds, and then they challenge Jesus. What are we to do with her? The law says we're to, do the, we're to stone her. What would you have us do? Oddest thing. These kinds of things just drive me crazy. When we see Jesus get down and he starts riding in the dirt, we think, what is he writing? I've looked at every conceivable commentary through the years. What is he writing? Looking for a <laughs> valid kind of explanation, some kind of really great theory. What is Jesus writing? But this week, preparing to be here with you all, I realize I'm asking the wrong question. It was not what was he writing. It was why was he writing? Because I don't know. I'm probably wrong. Don't take this down. But I wonder if maybe he was diverting their attention to the ground. Maybe what he was writing was deeply meaningful. But did you notice we don't get to know what it was? But somehow he diverted their attention. There's no telling how that woman was unclosed. Right. There's no telling what she looked like. Standing there made a public spectacle right. and he gets down on the ground. He does not stand up and address her until he has diverted so all the attention. All the stones have come to the ground and they have all walked away. So what, what are you going to do with the same you're like that. That's what we have in Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm going to think about that one for a while. Uh -huh. I, I think just what we've said, there's more I would say, but I think it all boils down to the, the reason he can have such deep empathy for our suffering is because he came and became one of us. And, and the fact that he came and became one of us means that every abuse that you or I have ever experienced, somehow Jesus knew. I read this this week. The crucified is the one most traumatized, most grieved, 
He bore the holocausts and genocides. He has carried the massacres, the starving, the crushing poverty and debilitating illnesses. He has carried every child who has been trafficked, tortured, abused, and thrown away. He was wounded for the sins of those who have perpetrated such horrors. He has been in the darkness. He has known the loss of all things. He has been abandoned by his father. He has been to hell. There is no part of any tragedy that he has not known and carried. Good grief. That's wow. our Savior. Wow. It's gorgeous. You know, when Beth was talking about the woman at the well in John 4, and he says, you know, you've had five husbands and you're, you know, you're working on another guy you're not living with right now. When I read that, I've never actually felt to put her down. I've always thought, that poor woman, I wonder if she was abused as a little girl because none of her relationships are working out right. And I, I just wonder, I've always felt such uh, compassion for, for that, that woman at the well who, because she had all of those, rela every relationship was a failure, a failure, a failure, and I go, what happened early in her life that kind of warped the worldview, created the fears, and all those other things that cause us to go from one relationship to another, break down after another? And I really think she should be seen more empathetically than any other way. Now, I, I want us to wrap it up with making our church a place for support. The Bible makes it very clear that we don't get well, we're not healed on our own. We need each other. We're better together, we're healed together. You will not get well on your own. That's right, that's right. That's the whole value of Celebrate Recovery, it's the whole value of the church, in that we're, God wired us in such a way that you only get healthy with the help of other people. So you need to swallow your pride and you need to release your fears and you need to say, God, I, I need help. Now, the church, the Bible says, is supposed to be a place of healing and hope and help. And what kind of church can actually offer that uh, to people, particularly people who are, as we're talking today, about sexually abused people? Well, God gives us the format or the environment for a healthy church. And he says, it's supposed to be like a healthy family. And he says, the church is not a business, it's the body of Christ. It, it, it's, not, it's not a corporation, it's a family. And it's a relationship. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter five, Paul is giving instructions to how we are to relate to each other uh, in the church as part of the same church fellowship. The Bible says, in the church, treat the older men as you would your own father. In other words, like spiritual fathers. Treat the younger men uh, as your brothers. Treat the older women as you would your own mother. And treat the younger women with purity as you would your own sister. Now, I've benefited from this now for 38 years here at Saddleback. I have spiritual fathers in this church. I've been walking with the Lord for over, oh, 55 years. But I have some men in this church who've walked with the Lord longer than me. And they are spiritual fathers to me. And I listen to them. And they give me advice. And they give me counsel. I have spiritual mothers in this church. They're all in their 70s and 80s or 90s, but they have walked with the Lord longer than me, and I listen to them, and they say, you know, uh, Pastor Rick, have you ever considered this from a pe feminine perspective? No, I haven't, thank you very much. And, and they've given me great advice. I have a lot of spiritual brothers in this church who advise me, I have a lot of spiritual sisters in this church who advise me and say, hey Rick, think about this, and I go, good point, great point, and they've saved me, some of the sisters have saved me from enormous moments of embarrassment. <laughs> and other falling flat on my face, so thank you. But that's the way God means for us to be. However, a lot of times in the church, we kind of clamp down on this issue rather than open up about this issue. Beth, talk about this. Yes, yes. Um, I was thinking of the verses out of Ephesians chapter five 
this week that I think speaks straight into it. Ephesians 5, I'm gonna read 11 and then 14. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. I think it's so important for the church to know it is God's desire that these kinds of things are exposed, that the church is not a shelter for abusers, but is a shelter for the abused, that it is a safe place for people to be protected. And verse 14 that says, I love this because this, you see the prescription, the prescription of love and light here. But when anything is exposed by the light, by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. And I don't say this to condemn, but to inform that, that when we're uncomfortable with these kinds of things being spoken about in our presence in public platforms, and you're certainly not who I'm talking about because here you are and you knew this was what you were coming into. So I, I applaud this group with everything I have. But when we squirm about it, we realize that we are inadvertently part of what we'll call the silence culture, mm. that we want this one to stay silent. Let's not talk about this. This is kind of gross. This makes me feel icky. I don't want to talk about it. But that's that silence culture that keeps it so um, such an infection in the body of Christ and keeps the church from being the safe place and the healthy place that it needs to be. One of the things that I have really, really dealt with, I've just gone over this and over this, especially this week, getting ready to serve here this weekend. Lord, why is it that the the world tends to be more willing to expose this and call this out than the church. That, that ought not be so. Why is it that we are hiding this, that we don't want to talk about it, but we're seeing, um, watching in USA Gymnastics and in that scandal coming to light, watch the Harvey Weinstein thing in Hollywood, all of this. Why is it we are dragging our feet here? And I thought, okay, we know, we could throw out lots of reasons here today, just protecting institution. Also the idea of just protecting the greater good, but it's such folly yeah. because all it's going to do, it's going to be the rumination of it. That's right. Because when we hide it like that, it is going to fracture from the inside out. That's right. uh, truly, truly. But I want to ask you to consider something in pencil. I, I just, this just keeps dawning on me this week mm -hmm. that I think it has something to do with the weight of guilt we all or most of us feel about just sexual issues and sins. Mm. Just give, give me a little bit of room here to, to say what I mean. I think that sexual sin is so prevalent among all of us. Okay, I'm gonna say most of us. Um, whether it just be in mentally, in a fantasy life, or very impure thoughts, whether it's pornography, whether it's our backgrounds, whether it's our present, whatever it may be, I think that what we tend to do is is that we see someone pulled out and indicted and we go, what if my sexual sins, it, does this have any merit to anybody? Mm -hmm. What if, if this were me? Mm -hmm. And they were telling, my, and so we transfer this on. It is imperative that you and I learn to differentiate between sexual immorality and sexual criminality. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen carefully. Hear, hear this, I want you to get this, very important, the difference between sexual immorality, immorality and sexual criminality. Big difference. Both are sin. Both have to be dealt with. Both need appropriate action. But one is sin, the other is not just sin, it is a crime. Right. One d d takes, both take proper action, but one takes more than proper action. It's like, don't just call for proper action, call for the police. That's right. So what we need right. desperately is for men and women. Okay, so get clear in your mind, honestly. Are you, have you assaulted someone? Yeah. Are, are you a rapist? Mm -hmm. Have you molested someone? For most of the people in this room, the answer to that is no. Call it out. It's criminal. Yeah. It's criminal. It's not the same as you. Yes, it's all sin, but this has got to be rooted out, and That's the right. church has to lead in rooting it out. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm so glad Beth brought this up. You know, I'm a pastor, 
And the word pastor actually means shepherd. The word shepherd and pastor are the word, same word in Greek, poimen. I'm a shepherd, I'm a pastor. And in John chapter 10, it says that the good shepherd, the good pastor, protects the flock, the sheep, from the wolves. It is my job, if you're in this flock, to protect you from the wolves. I want to be very clear here. Now, I feel this very deeply. When I say Saddleback Church is a safe place, it is safe for the sheep. It is not safe for the wolves. Mm, that's right. It is safe for the victims. It is not safe here for perpetrators. And, and I want to say this with all of the strength I've got that if you are a perpetrator and you try to pray on this flock, I'm coming after you, I will find you out, I will expose you, and I will turn you in. Okay, you can count on that. Um, I just want you to be really, don't you dare do that in this flock because I will hunt you down and I can guarantee you that the rest of the men in this church will help me. Amen. Amen. I want to close with a couple verses for those of you who may, in the, in the crowd this size, we know there are lots of victims. But in a crowd this size, we also know there's some people who have been perpetrators. So there are a couple verses I want to close with this. On the screen, John 8, 32, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And if you have been guilty of this, you need to turn yourself in and you need to throw yourself on the grace and mercy of God. Yes. It is available, but you've got to throw yourself on the grace and mercy of God. And, and you need to do that for three reasons. Uh, number one, our culture is not going to put up with you anymore. The tide is turning. People are now being exposed. People are not gonna keep silent. They're not gonna shut up about this because it's been too long. And so you're not gonna really have any place to hide. Second, you're going to live with fear and guilt uh, and shame until you own up. And the third reason you need to come clean and throw yourself on the grace of God is because you are headed for severe judgment if you don't, unless you repent. Now the good news is, there is a savior available. That's what Saddleback's all about. There is grace and there is forgiveness. And the other verse on the screen is this, 1 John 1, 7 to 9, and it says this. If we are living in the light, in other words, we're not hiding any secrets. If we're living in the light of Christ, then we can have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. Now, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. We're just kidding ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. We're lying to ourselves if we say we have not sinned. And there's no truth in us. But if we confess our sins, what does it mean to confess? It means to agree with God it was wrong. The word confess is the Greek word homo logeo. Homo means same, homosexual, same sex. Homogenized milk, it's all mixed together. So, logeo means to speak. Homo logeo, I speak the same, I agree with God. God, that was wrong. I don't excuse it, I don't blame it, I don't defend it, I don't bribe, I don't bargain, I just admit it. If we confess our sins to him, God is faithful and God is just. He'll keep his promises to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from every, that means every act we've ever done wrong. That is a great, great promise. Last week, here in America, uh, was concluded the largest sexual abuse court case in history, where 160 women gave testimony or signed uh, uh, reports, impact uh, statements about one guy, a coach, Larry Nasser and all of the abuse he had done over years and years in, in gymnastics. And before he was sentenced to 175 years in prison, those women were given the opportunity to confront their abuser. 
Rachel Drollinger was the final speaker. What she said had so much impact, I wanna just play one minute. I want you to listen to what she had to say as she confronts her abuser in that court. But I want you to understand why I made this choice, knowing full well what it was going to cost to get here and with very little hope of ever succeeding. I did it because it was right. No matter the cost, it was right. And the farthest I can run from what you have become is to daily choose what is right instead of what I want. You have become a man ruled by selfish and perverted desires. A man defined by his daily choices over and over again to feed that selfishness and perversion. You chose to pursue your wickedness no matter what it cost others. And the opposite of what you have done is for me to choose to love sacrificially, no matter what it costs me. In our early hearings, you brought your Bible into the courtroom and you have spoken of praying for forgiveness. And so it is on that basis that I appeal to you. If you have read the Bible you carry, you know that the definition of sacrificial love portrayed is of God himself loving so sacrificially that he gave up everything to pay a penalty for the sin he did not commit. By his grace, I too choose to love this way. You spoke of praying for forgiveness, but Larry, if you have read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things, as if good deeds can erase what you have done. It comes from repentance which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you have done in all of its utter depravity and horror without mitigation, without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you have seen in this courtroom today. The Bible you carry says it is better for a millstone to be thrown around your neck and you thrown into a lake than for you to make even one child stumble. And you have damaged hundreds the Bible you speak carries a final judgment where all of God's wrath and its eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. So we cheapen what Jesus Christ did on the cross all that suffering, all that pain, all that shame, we cheapen it when we imply that it's only about forgiveness and about the grace of God. Of course it's about the grace and forgiveness of God because Jesus is dying for your sins so you don't have to die for them, you don't have to pay for them. But the cross also shows how much God hates evil and how much he is angry at sin, why? Because sin damages the people he created. It damages both the offender and the offended. It warps both the perpetrator and the victim. I'm gonna close with two prayers. I'm gonna pray a prayer of salvation for those of you who have been perpetrators because it's your only hope. And then I'm gonna pray a prayer of healing for those of you who have been victimized. Let's bow our heads. Now all of us have sinned, so we all need to confess we're not all abusers, but everybody has blown it and made mistakes. So why don't you just in your heart say this, dear God, I admit that I have sinned in life. I've done many things wrong, and in many ways I've tried to be my own God call my own shots, be my own Lord, and I'm sorry. 
And today, God, I throw myself on your grace. I don't deserve your forgiveness, but you are a forgiving God. And I ask you to show me your grace because of who you are, not because of who I am. I don't understand it all, but as much as I know how, Jesus Christ, I accept what you did for me on the cross, that you paid for all my sins so I don't have to pay for them. And today, I, I wanna learn to get to know you. I wanna learn to trust you. And as much as I know how, Jesus Christ, I ask you to become the boss of my life, the Lord the president, the CEO, I want you to call the shots from here on out. I wanna know your plan and your purpose for my life. And I humbly ask that you accept me into your family and one day into your heaven simply because of your grace. Yes. Those of you who have carried the pain and the shame and the grief and the anger and all the other emotions, the fears from abuse or assault or harassment, you, you follow me in this prayer. Dear God, I'm scared to death, but I wanna give you all the experiences of my life. And Lord, you know how much they have pained me. I need a savior. I need a healer. Jesus, I need you. I need you to do for me what you've done for millions of other people. And so I'm willing to start this journey of faith, of going through the tunnel of truth, of dealing with the things that have frightened me, but I know that I don't have to fear that through that tunnel you'll be holding my hand. And you have a good plan for my life. So I give you all the pieces of my life. And in exchange, I ask for your peace for my pieces. I humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. -day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.